Studio 212. Com check. DPS. Go. Inco. Go. PUS. Go. Surgeon. Go. Booster. Go. Copy that. We have a go from you guys. This is talking sound. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the Talking Sound Podcast, the only podcast on the internet where negative 10 is a number to be desired. I am Chris Jordan, your host, and today on the Talking Sound Podcast, we are actually going to be discussing gear, Um, but not necessarily in a general way, more of like, how do you go about purchasing your gear, you know, and I've been asked over the years, how do you accrue things like this? Like we're here in the home studio right now. Um, How do you accrue all of this technology? How do you get it? How do you make sure that you're getting quality? And how do you make sure that you're actually getting what you need? That last part is actually the most important. You know, it's funny because we've been asked numerous times uh, why our tagline is where negative 10 is a number to be desired. Um, For those of you that don't know, there are really two um, differentiations in equipment. Um, decibel levels or dB levels for audio gear, and that is negative 10 plus 4. Plus 4 is for professional studio, live gear, things like that. Negative 10 is really for home use. It's consumer grade. It's like your RCA output, you know, stuff like that off the back of a CD player or something. Um, That's negative 10. And people have asked me why on a podcast where you're talking about Um, audio and sound and production, are you talking about negative 10 being a number to be desired? Um, Myself, I say negative 10 is a number to be desired because I come from a very old school um, philosophy when it comes to mixing, engineering, recording, um, getting the sounds that you're trying to get. I am of the attitude of do whatever it takes. Um, There are pieces of equipment back here that are meant for guitar use that I use for vocals. There are pieces of equipment uh, that are from, like, the mid-1960s, early 1970s, you know, um, and that are mono. You know, like, I have some mono compressors and things like that in the collection that um, they were what I started my studio with, um, and I sold them, and then years later wanted that sound again. I wanted to be able to recreate some of the sound that I had whenever I recorded those original pieces, uh, like, 15 years ago. So I looked them up, I found them, and uh, managed to buy them off Craigslist for like 15, 20 bucks, something like that. I think one of the compressors I actually got, the 163, I got for five bucks because it was crackling, and uh, I replaced the capacitors in it, and sings beautifully, works great. Um, That's one tip right there, is number one, know your equipment. Know what you're looking for and what your desired result is. Um, I've told people more than once, you'd be amazed what you can do with an analog four track and an SM58 microphone with a small little mixer. Um, It's all in how you use the equipment at your disposal. Now, yeah, there is some different noise floor to be uh, dealt with when it comes to negative 10 plus four, you know, negative 10, you're going to have a greater noise floor. You're going to have more noise to signal ratio instead of signal to noise as you would with plus four, um, because of course, plus four is a higher, um, a higher dB level. So, uh, you know, it, it's really, to me, it comes down to what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to, you know, achieve a classic tone, like you may have to go with the Moog or something like that, like what I have back here behind me, um, because that's that's just the only way like there there's only one way to get that synthesizer bass swell that happens that like rumbles your belly and that's with a moog there's only one way to get it um you can use emulators and things like that in this day and age you can use a lot of in the box technology as it's called or programs plugins vsts uh virtual sound engines things like that and You do have a great panoply of that at your disposal. You do have a great opportunity with that. It really comes down to, once again, what you're wanting to do. Um, I recommend everybody at least have a digital tracking rig. You can can pick up some things very affordably nowadays. Uh, You know, I'm a big fan of the uh, the Scarlett Focusrite, uh, or Scarlett by Focusrite, rather. and it's, it's a really good interface for the price. You'll get stereo recording out of it. 
for under 200 bucks. Um, you can go cheaper than that. You can go um, with, a, with a $99 USB box by PreSonus that has uh, tube emulation on the, on the preamp and has left and right output to go to a hard recorder for backup and USB to be able to plug in and get stereo to your tracking system. Now, uh, it's, it's really six of one, half a dozen of the other. The computerized stuff is definitely a lot easier. You've got fewer wires to deal with. You can see over here, I've got like 248 input patch bays, and I'm still trying to figure out how to add to my system. Um, because I am a gear hog. I love to play with gear. I love to switch things around. I love to put things in for different uses, different purposes. So I have actually made it my mission in life that whenever there's a piece of gear that I want, whenever there's a piece of gear that I'm looking for, um, I'll set a little cash aside, you know, I'll squirrel aside a little nut um, just to make sure that uh, what I'm looking for, I can get. And it's, when it comes to purchasing your gear, like I said, number one, know your gear, know your equipment, know what you're looking for. Number two, know your price ranges, know the price ranges of what you're looking for. That's so important. Um, especially if you're out buying used gear. Now I myself am a huge used gear buyer. Um, I don't buy a lot off of eBay. I do buy a lot off of Craigslist. Um, and from persons that I know who are getting rid of stuff. I'll always throw in some cash, something like that. Um, but yeah, I don't like eBay because I can't meet somebody. I can't turn knobs. I can't see it turn on. I've been burned a couple times, not majorly, but really where it was like, mm, not really the condition that the picture showed it to be in, you know, or not really the functionality that you said that it had in the ad. So um, I like being able to go out. I'm a big pawn shopper. Um, but you got to be frugal. You got to be careful with a pawn shop, you know, because um, they've bought things at a cut rate price. If something costs, let's say, if it's a hundred dollar microphone new, they'll buy it from somebody for 10 bucks and turn around and sell it for 80. Um, so you've got some room for negotiation, but they definitely want to make their nut. They've got to make at least 25% off of uh, 25 to 35% off of what they uh, purchase something for, and they're really looking for more like 50 to 70 percent uh, over what they purchased it for. So um, that's that's the way those numbers work in a pawn shop. And don't be afraid to negotiate. You know, if you see something for $89, don't be afraid to tell them like, hey, I'll give you 60 bucks cash for it right now um, and start the negotiation there. Um, you know, just take a third of the price off, bam, and tell them you'll pay cash either on a debit card or uh, go and get cash from an ATM. Um, and you'd be surprised what happens. Now, the other trick is actually knowing how to test gear, actually bringing a little bit of test equipment with you, maybe a microphone, a cable. Like, number one, I'm rarely, rarely traveling without a microphone and mic cable somewhere in my vehicle. Um, and that probably actually opens me up to theft, just putting that out there. Uh, but... Um, you know, it's it's been probably 20 years now that I've traveled with a, at least a mic and a mic cable with me because people have asked me to check out equipment in their rehearsal space, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, or I've been out pawn shopping and run across something and been like, ah, I want to check that out. I want to see what that's like. So I normally have a couple of like quarter inch patch cables, like a small little signal, nine volt signal generator that I made with like square wave or something. So if I'm testing a guitar pedal at a pawn shop, uh, I can get some kind of sound through it that I'm that's dependable, um, <clears throat> but especially with delays and that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, you don't have to get that crazy. All you have to actually do is know your gear. You know, all you actually have to do is know how to go about uh, getting that and making sure that um, what you're getting is quality. And that's that's really what this episode is about is quality. It's great to have a lot of gear, but really what's essential is buying the best that you can afford. Now, nobody's saying that you have to go out and buy like a manly compressor for $3,500 or something like that, or that you have to go out and buy a Neumann tube microphone for things to sound good. Okay. You can, like I said, go out and gladly buy any, any USB box, uh, by, by PreSonus for a hundred dollars off Amazon 
and you can absolutely buy, you know, a $50 large diaphragm cheap microphone and get some great results just with that. Um, and start there. Really, you know, like I said, know your gear. Know your gear. So before you go out and invest in a TBX tube strip, you know, for $350, buy a cheaper preamp. Um, learn the ins and outs of it. Learn what the gain structure should be. Learn what these things should be doing, you know, and uh, really learn what the buttons, things like that work with. Um, that is one thing that's great about the digital realm is that you can plug in a compressor or something like that and play around with settings, play around with buttons uh, without having to purchase these things and at least get familiar with the layout because all your stuff's going to have the basic same ins and outs. It's going to have input, output, maybe a pass through, you know, maybe a mute switch, something like that in the back that you can engage or an insert cable um, of some sort, you know, send and return. But whenever it comes to your compressors, most of them are going to have the same thing. Whenever it comes to your effects, most of them are going to have the same thing. They're just going to be located in different parts of the menu. They're just going to be located in different parts of the device. So you really have to get comfortable with it. I myself do a lot of camera work and, you know, be it JVC, Sony, Panasonic, Canon, uh, you know, uh, any, any of those, any of the above, any of the below... Um, I feel comfortable breaking into the menu on that camera and messing around with settings because I've played around with enough cameras in my time that I know where most of those settings should be. And really, quite a few of them will be in almost the same place, whether it's a different brand or not. Um, it's just that the menu will be relabeled or something like that. Now, when it comes to digital stuff, um, I'm, I'm a much bigger fan of buying used analog equipment than I am buying used digital. And what do I mean by digital? Um, digital, I mean, you know, things like um, uh, a modern day vocoder, you know, things like that. Um, even synthesizers. I'm, I'm wary on that because um, there's a lot of that that's not quote unquote through whole technology. And what that means is that the circuit board is built like what you're seeing on screen here, where literally, you know, the parts are traditional looking. Uh, they, they look like regular electronics parts that you would go to Radio Shack and see. Um, the digital circuits are much more sensitive and even static, static sensitive, where if you open them up without them being grounded, things like that, you can blow chips and microprocessors immediately. Um, I've had that happen on a cut. I learned my lesson on a couple of delay pedals that I was uh, modifying and when I was first learning to mod and it was like, oh my God, what the heck? And come to find out, yeah, because of the digital circuitry, you have to have it grounded properly. And if you don't um, and you get a static charge there, you can discharge into the circuit and destroy it. And that's what happened. Um, unfortunately, a lot of modern electronics, a lot of the smaller format stuff is being made with what's called surface mount or computer parts. And truly, they're a lot cleaner, technically. Um, the reason why they sound harsh is because it is such a pure signal. Um, there are no harmonics there or anything like that. So um, that's why analog sounds warmer. There's a small amount of distortion. There's a small amount of noise inside that circuit, you know, that it kind of makes the ear feel a little bit better than hearing just direct one and zero representation of what it's hearing. Um, and that's the difference between those things, you know, whenever you're talking about modern small format guitar pedals versus older large format guitar pedals. Um, the only way you're going to get your Strymon timelines and the, the options for delays and reverb and reverb on delays and a delay in the left and a reverb in the right and all that kind of stuff is playing with digital circuitry. That's, that's the only way you're going to be able to get it to fit into that small of a platform and that small of a package. So um, I tend to veer away from buying a lot of those things because they are so static sensitive, because they are so sensitive that uh, they tend to um, break with stray voltages. I, I literally <clears throat> was playing one night in my studio and had an Alesis uh, keyboard go out while I was playing. We had just like a small little surge that happened. 
um, apparently a storm started rolling in and everything else came back on except that. And when I looked it up, sure enough, that was part of the problem was that the power filtering circuit um, was was not that hardy, so to speak. And whenever it, uh, yeah, whenever it dealt with surges or a sudden surge of static electricity, it was like, you know, use this thing in the studio all you want, but don't take it on the road. Um, you may be disappointed one day if it's an integral part of your sound. And I was a little disappointed because I wanted to play with it. And I ended up using a buddy of mine's for the album, but... Um, you know, it, it was a chance that I took, you know, having all of the, all of the digital things, all of the, all of the crazy stuff. And, you know, it was just something that, Hey, it happens, but what do you do when it happens? How do you deal with it? You know, really, um, there were other means by which for me to get things done. I was able to go out and borrow something, but, um, other than that, it would have been a multiple hundred dollar replacement. Um, in order to replace that synthesizer and get that done properly. So um, you really have to choose your gear carefully. You really do have to do your research whenever you're looking into what gear to buy. And try not to buy, try to, try to buy gear that is, as it would be called, that's evergreen, um, that digital or analog, you would be able to use it. Um, try to buy stuff that um, you'll get multiple uses out of, you know, I recently just took a bunch of stuff out of my rack because I, it's one trick pony, you know, and it's cool to have it in there, but it's really taking up some valuable real estate. And I had to move things out to make room for stuff that I could use on regular projects, things that I'm getting ready to do. Um, and you know, like I said, I've got stacks of rack gear and things like that. It's, it's insanity. Um, and you know, it, it takes a disciplined mind to actually make sense of all of it, to actually make sense of the patch bay, to make sense of the signal flow of what your home studio is, to make sense of the signal flow of what your portable rig is. But whether it's your home studio or your portable rig, really, really, really the key here is try to break it down to simplicity. Try not to have too many things in chain. Try not to have too many points of decision along there. You know, um, the, the plus side about a modern digital console is that it's got everything built into it. You don't have to bring the rack of effects. You don't have to bring the rack of compression. Um, but at the same time, I think um, it, can, it can lead to over-mixing. Uh, from what I've seen, because there is every bell and whistle um, available. Uh, an engineer can spend all night tweaking mixes instead of just sitting back and letting things fall into a mix where they should. Um, and I, I find that to be a dangerous point of view, uh, to, to have so many things at your fingertips. Um, it, you know, I've seen sound checks take forever because it's not just right there. You know, it's not just like, oh, left monitor, there's the equalizer. Boom, boom, boom. You know, um, it, it offers a lot of versatility for a lot less money, but at the same time, like I said, can cause overproduction, can cause overmixing issues. And um, for me, it's something I, I like analog. I like the warmth of analog. I like to um, basically use my digital system as a large multi track. Um, I'm still outputting things to analog and then um, putting them through effects and then recording them back to digital. That way it, it maintains as much of an analog process as possible. I like to move knobs and play with them while things go on. And it's kind of tough to do that in the digital realm, um, at least with the setup that I have. And I've invested so much time uh, and dedication into an analog rig, I'd much rather use my rig the way I see fit. Um, than to have to be locked in to buying a piece of equipment just because the industry says I should. And that's another consideration, um, is should you be buying the piece of equipment that you're looking at? Is it necessary to buy it? Um, I recently updated to HD cameras um, fully. And, you know, I've, I've been needing to buy a large format HD camera and was able to do it um, God bless me, but it opens up a new realm of business for me. It opens up a new, uh, avenue of revenue 
So for me, it was important not only for that, but for some personal projects as well. And it's going to have multiple uses. It's going to pay for itself rapidly. And that's that's really the question that comes to bear, especially as a home musician, as a broke musician. You know, what what is the cost effectiveness? What is the bang for the buck out of the piece of gear that you're getting? And it, that's what you have to look at is how often are you going to be using this piece of equipment? How often is it that this thing's going to be turned on, um, the signal's going to be pumped through it, and you're going to be using it? Because if it's not going to be that frequently, if it's going to be a case of, uh, you know, hey, I'm going to use it every six months, and you aren't necessarily, like, doing projects for other people, or, you know, your studio doesn't necessarily make money in that way where you're mixing or engineering for other people um, or just tracking and recording, and that's not going to get its regular playtime and get its money worth out of it, then you should really reconsider purchasing the piece of gear. Remember that. You don't always have to say yes. Even when you start a discussion at a pawn shop, you do not always have to complete the deal just because you asked a guy for some time and to take a look at a piece of gear and you spent 30 minutes or so playing with it there in the shop does not mean that you have to purchase the piece of gear. If it's not at a price that you're looking for, feel free to walk away. Walk away from the purchase. It's okay. You didn't have the piece of gear before and you were able to get things done. You'll probably be able to get them done now. And that's, that's really what you have to look at is what is the pertinence of buying this piece of equipment? What is the necessity of buying this piece of equipment? If it's something that absolutely will change the way that your studio works, if it's something that will absolutely drastically change the way your music is played and recorded on a regular basis, then yes, substantiate the funds. Um, but if it's something that you're using for one or two songs on an album, you know, go out and see if you can rent it. You know, there are, like, I live here in Austin, um, and there are many, many uh, local rental houses that you can go to to rent pieces of equipment, that you can go to to rent keyboards, synthesizers, drum kits, all that kind of stuff. So don't hesitate to go out and do that to get the desired result that you need on a project. Don't, don't go out and spend, you know, six seven hundred dollars on a Roland Gaia keyboard when you could go out to the rental location and spend 50 bucks or 10 bucks a week you know five bucks a day something like that to rent it and uh you know actually actually get your use for the money out of it as opposed to um actively spending a whole lot of money out of pocket because that's really what it's about you want to build your system you know you want this to be a labor and it's gonna be a labor of love over the years your home studio so um, really it's something that you have to take care of you have to kind of curate what it is that you're looking to do what it is that you're trying to do with your system and really make sure that uh, you find the best pieces of equipment that you need to get that job done um, and whether that's a uh, a $30 microphone, you know, or whether it's a $100 microphone or a $1,000 microphone. Um, I have recorded with all of them. I have recorded with every single one of them. I've used every one of them on an album. Um, I wish I could go back and change some of my knowledge of how to use that $30 microphone and tell that kid uh, 18, 19 years ago, hey, this is how to properly use that $20 microphone and get the best best bang for your buck out of audio. But, uh, you know, things have been learned. You, you, you tend to learn different techniques when you're forced to. And that's why I'll always, I'll always be a proponent of somebody building a small home rig, um, somebody trying to understand the way these things work, but not spending a bunch of money. Start off small, you know, you, you'll always need a backup, number one. Number two, you can always upgrade. You know, you can always, that's what I did with the camera. I went out and bought the camera and then sold one of my old SD cameras um, that I will now no longer have a use for, you know. So um, that kind of defrayed some of the cost. You can absolutely swap gear out. 
like that in and out of your life. Um, and I, for a long time, I had the policy of I no longer get rid of gear. And now it's to the point where I've got so much gear, it's busting out of the windows and uh, I need to shed some skin. I need to get rid of some stuff and really trim to, trim the fat. So um, I'm looking at putting some up for sale so that I can buy other things that I need instead of the money coming out of my pocket. So that's one way that you can grow your home studio right there is to actually sell gear to buy new gear, um, trade gear up with people that you know, um, do some Craigslist swaps, you know, stuff like that. Put things out there. Let people know what you have for trade. Um, check your local bulletin boards. Check your local Facebook groups. Um, there are a couple of different equipment Facebook groups here in Austin where people try to sell gear and equipment, stuff like that. So, you know, there are numerous outlets for you to be able to find the equipment that you're looking for at the prices that you're looking for. Main things are know your equipment, um, know, know how to check equipment, how to test equipment, what the equipment should do and what it shouldn't do. Um, know the approximate price range of your equipment, all right? That's so important to know what the going rate is. Um, check eBay, but check confirmed sales. Check confirmed sales, what it went for, not what it's actively bidding for, but what it sold for. Um, you know, in addition to those two, you want to know um, what purposes you're buying the equipment for. Like, what are the true reasons? And is the piece of equipment absolutely necessary? And, you know, you also want to know... Um, is that piece of equipment forward compatible? Is that something that you will be able to use on future projects, not just the one that you're working on now? So, you know, it, it, there's a lot to take into effect. And really, um, when you're buying equipment for a studio, you, you have to make, try to make long-term decisions. Try to make as permanent decisions as possible. You know, do your research, do your homework, um, figure out exactly what it is that you're trying to do, you know, and uh, really, really get the commitment down um, to, to not buy just for the sake of buying. Um, don't, don't just buy willy-nilly. Buy it because you need it. Buy it because it's going to grow your art, because it's going to grow your knowledge. Um, don't buy things just for the sake of it. It's, it's a way to get yourself into debt, especially if you're running off credit or going to Guitar Center on credit, anything like that. Um, just be careful whenever you're buying used equipment. Make sure that you know what you're doing. Make sure that you know what you're looking for. So um, on that note, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode, third episode of the new third season of the Talking Sound Podcast. I am once again Chris Jordan, your host. Uh, while you're online checking out Talking Sound and checking out this episode, please feel free to cruise the website. We have some great articles up um, from some of the latest in the industry. Uh, we have some articles up about the halftime show at the Super Bowl, all kinds of things like that. Um, go by and check that out. We also have the amazing AV freelance list uh, across the country. If you're an AV freelancer, if you're an audio engineer, video engineer, cameraman, stagehand, um, what have you, um, even a carpenter, hop on, check it out, go to the AV Freelance directory, and you can click on your state. You know, they're divided by regions, and that region will take you to a page with the states. You click on the city, and it'll give you a full listing of things that are available. If you happen to go to your region or state or city and don't see companies there that hire freelance AV technicians and you know of some, let us know. This is a karma thing, guys. We're trying to spread the word. We're trying to let people be able to find jobs in the industry anywhere that they're going, anywhere that they're gigging. So please help us out. Stop on by. There's a widget right there on the right-hand side that'll let you know um, where you can go and actually... Um, contact us, let us know what the company is and what their website is, and we will absolutely add them to that directory. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in and continuing to tune in, tune in. All of you that are regular watchers and listeners, I am Chris Jordan, your host. This is the Talking Sound Podcast, and until next time, keep reaching for 11. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>
sound.